42 exists to establish a genuine Acts 2 community that inspires generations to boldly live out their destiny in Christ. Acts 2 was a movement that not only defined the church, but revealed Christ's devout followers. Acts 2 was the movement that allowed generation after generation to see, feel, and hear God. It was the movement that solidified the ideals of family and proved the cost of true love by laying down one's own life for another. It was the movement that shook the foundations of every religion and challenged the established governments to show their hidden motives. It was the movement that did not fear death or man, but demanded freedom and righteousness from those they called brothers and sisters. This was the movement that put God at the forefront of everything and required that every person make a decision regarding whom they called God. It was the movement that has forever changed our history and our future. That movement in recent times seems to have lost much of its energy and exuberance. It's a time for a new resurgence. It's time for God's people to unite and ignite a passion in one another that goes far beyond a church service. It's time for a level of involvement that eradicates injustice and replaces it with righteousness. It's time for a passion that welcomes the despondent, disillusioned, and downtrodden from every race, creed, and color. It's time for a passion, once again, to show the world that God's words are as valid today as they were in the beginning. For such a time like this we were born, and for such a time like this we were called. It's time to rise up and become the church once again. Amen? Amen. So if you guys don't know, that is our, uh, our, that is our vision statement right there. And that's one of the reasons why we do what we do, why we gather every Sunday, is we want to see the church rise up um, and be the community that it was called to be. Um, I think you guys, in the last uh, couple years, if not, you can see in the last couple decades, um, the church has taken many hits. Uh, when I say church, I'm talking big C church. Um, there's been a lot of things. There's a lot of scandals, a lot of this and a lot of that. And um, people don't trust the church like they used to. And I want to get, I, our hope here at Church 242 is that we can get back to a place to where people can start trusting the church once again. Um, and obviously the church being you, the people, that they would trust in the people. So when they hear church, they don't go, oh, that place, but they go church, and you're like, oh yeah, I should go to that, or I want to be a part of that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, hey, if you're new here, my name is uh, Pastor Craig Hamilton. Um, I have this weird cork with me. Um, I, let, I want you to talk back to me. Is that okay? Yeah. See, like four of you, five of you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll restart it. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Pastor Craig. I got this weird cork with me, and I, I like people to talk back with me. Is that okay? Yeah. I see that's way better. Okay. Um, I just, it just makes me know that you're paying attention or that you guys are actually following along and I'm not totally boring you to death. Sound good? Yeah. All right. We'll get it. Don't worry. Um, I was praying about this day and uh, basically this moment when, um, basically when we, God, what are you doing when we, the building is a building. It's, I mean, in all honesty, it's, it's, it's just a shell. It's obviously what happens within the shell that, that means the most. And so I was asking God, I was, I was like, God, um, we got this building and, and, and we're going to make it, we're going to make it as cool as we possibly can, God. Um, but I want to know, God, what do you want? And he kept sharing with me um, Luke chapter 15. And I kept reading Luke chapter 15. I read it a couple times, actually. Um, and, and Luke chapter 15, um, it doesn't talk about a building at all. It doesn't talk about anything remotely close to a building at all. And so I was like, okay, God, I'm a little, I'm a little, I'm interested. And then I started to pick up on, on what he was trying to say. And so today, I want to share with you guys Luke chapter 15. Now, if I read an entire chapter to you, that would be absolutely boring. I totally understand that. So I am going to do basically uh, biblical accounts with Craig Hamilton. It's going to be it's like story time with Craig Hamilton, okay? Um, so this is what we're going to do. I'm going to share uh, uh, basically the entire chapter of Luke 15 with you guys. And um, my hope is, is at the end of it, you guys would just kind of see what God is doing. Amen? Amen? Amen. So here's how it works. I'm going to start us off with this. You can imagine this. It's a lunchtime. It's lunch. We're hanging out at lunch. Jesus 
is in the room. And he's having a conversation uh, with tax collectors. And he's having a conversation with prostitutes and all these people that are considered to be sinners. And as he's sitting there and he's having this conversation with uh, these sinners, um, all of a sudden the religious people walk into the room. They're known as the Pharisees. And as they walk into the room, their noses are pointed to the air and they have this smug look on them like, I'm better than all of you. And as they walk into this room, Jesus kind of catches eyes with them. And as he catches eyes with them, um, he starts to do this. He starts to basically share these stories. They're known as parables, okay? Now, these parables, they're, they're stories. Now, here's the thing. I, I'm going to try to dumb it down as much as I possibly can. So a parable, obviously, is a story. The problem is with parables, we think that parables are more of like allegories. An allegory is basically when you take something and it relates to something else. Yeah? yeah. So if I use like a, an allegory saying, you know, like there was this guy, um, or there was, uh, there was, how to put it, um, there was um, a, a shepherd and there was a sheep, an allegory would look at it and say, okay, who is the shepherd and who is the sheep in the story? And we would say, God is the shepherd and you are the sheep, right? And that's how we do it, and that's an allegory. The problem that we have here is that not every parable that Jesus uses is an allegory. Which means this, if it's not an allegory and it doesn't relate back and forth to something else, then what does it do? Sometimes parables are just to give one solid point. Did, did that make sense? And so these parables that he's giving, um, we want to, we so badly want these parables to be an allegory to our lives. But the problem is, is sometimes he's just sharing these parables to give one solid point. And so I'm going to share this because see, when Jesus is sitting down with the tax collectors um, and, and all these sinners and the Pharisees walk in, they literally look at each other and they say, see, why do, has anybody follow this man? He's a friend of sinners. And so Jesus stands up and he gives a parable. And this was the parable that he gave. He said there was a shepherd. And he had a hundred sheep. But one of them went astray. He said, wouldn't the shepherd leave the 99 in the field and go after the stray? And when he would find the stray, would he not bring it back and rejoice with all the other shepherds and with all the other people that the, that the sheep has been returned? Random lunch story, right? Now here's the thing. We so bad want this to be an allegory, don't we? We so bad want to be that sheep. We do. We want to be that little lost sheep and Jesus comes and he finds us and he pets us and he carries us back to his little flock and drops us off. Because that makes it nice and neat, doesn't it? The problem is, is um, I don't know if you're a shepherd, but I'm not a shepherd. Um, I've never actually dealt with sheep before. Uh, I think they kind of smell. Um, and they're not very nice animals. I mean, some of them you can pet, but most of them always try to bite me. Anyways, um, so sheep, and I was asking a shepherd about this. I said, um, what do you do with a sheep? Like, because I want to know about this, these kind of parables or this kind of stuff, this thought process. And he said, what, what do you do when, when, when they, a, a sheep goes astray? How do you deal with that? And he goes, oh, oh, that's easy. See, usually when a sheep goes astray, um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to show basically a dominance. They're trying to say, you can't control me. I do what I want. And it goes off. So the way, that we, the way that we deal with that is that we will go and we find that sheep, um, we grab that sheep, and we will break one of its legs. Oh yeah, you want to be the sheep now, don't you? <laughs> they would actually break one of its legs and then they would carry that sheep, because obviously the, she the sheep can't walk. They would then carry that sheep over, uh, over their shoulders and bring it back to the flock. And then the shepherd would then have to nurse that sheep uh, back to health until it was fully restored. 
And you're like, why in the world would you do that? It seems like so much trouble for the shepherd. It is, but, if, but once you broke the leg, what happens? You have to be right next to the shepherd because you have learned dependence on the shepherd and not on yourself. Did that make sense? Now that's awesome, right? Unless you're one of those sinners that you're astray, then you're like, I like my legs, please. Jesus, don't hurt me, right? But here's the thing, it's this idea of de uh, dependence. But once again, this story is not, this parable is not an allegory. He's trying to make a point. See, he shares this story about the sheep coming back and then everybody rejoicing and everybody celebrating. And he looks over at the Pharisees, the religious people, and they don't like this story. So he tries another one. He says it's like a woman that has 10 silver denarii. Now, denarii, basically one of them is like 10 days worth of wages. He said, I, I, they, she has 10 denarii, but she loses one of them. Does she not tear the entire house upside down, clean the entire house as much as she can so she could find the one coin? And then when she finds the coin, does she not call up her friends and her neighbors and do they not celebrate together and rejoice together? Now that's a weird parable, right? Because now if you're trying to make it an allegory, you're like, am I a coin? Or am I the woman? What did you lose? Do you see the difference in, in, in that? So now, so once again, Jesus is trying to make this solid point and he looks over at the, at the Pharisees and as he looks over at the Pharisees, they're not rejoicing, they're not getting this at all. Now the funny part is, is the tax collectors, the sinners and all those, they're like, uh, yeah, you would rejoice. And the Pharisees are like, no. So Jesus tries one more time and he gives this story of the prodigal son. He says... This is what it's like. It's like a father that has two sons, an older and a younger one. And one day, the younger son comes to the father and says to him, I want what's owed to me. Basically what he's saying to him is, I want my inheritance now. I don't want to wait until you're dead. I want it now. And I find this to be super fascinating because when you actually read it in the scriptures, it says that the father then took um, his property and divided it up between the older and the younger. He says, it says them, but when he says them, that means he took the money to the, and gave it to the older and he took the money and he gave it to the younger. He gave it to them both, even though the older one never asked. Hold on to that thought, okay? Now the younger one takes his inheritance and it says that he goes to a far off country. And he's at this far off country, he lives it up. He is wined and dined. He, I mean, it is, now let's just be real. We've seen tons of movies, even shows where they're like partying it up in the club, whatever. He's just wasting money all over the place, um, right? You guys know what I'm talking about, yeah? I'm just making sure you're all with me, okay? Because I know this is a story you've heard before, but he goes off and he just squanders all of it. Just all the money. Now, some of you guys might be sitting back here today and you might be like, well, he's just never lived that way before, so he's just trying it out. The problem is, is that in this parable, if you, if you have enough money to split it up before the guy dies, you have a lot of money. So more than likely, even though it's just a story, he probably came from wealth, right? The silver spoon in his mouth. But once again, it's a parable. We don't need to read into it. We just know this, that the guy went and he squandered it all. Now, at the end of his squandering, at the end of all of his stuff, all of his money is now gone. He has nothing left. And all of a sudden, a famine hit the, uh, hit the region. And when the famine hit the region, he had no money. There were no jobs. And he didn't know what to do. So he basically became a servant. And he started working with some pigs. But he was starving to death. 
And he was taking the pods or the slop that he was giving the pigs and he was looking at all this nasty stuff and he's like, I hunger for what they're eating. Which if you guys want to know what they're eating, it's gross, okay? Think about it. it's the nastiest stuff. And nowadays we feed pigs whatever, like super nice. Now this stuff is nasty. Basically just think sewage water, throw it in there and be like, eh, yeah? No reaction from anybody? Okay, nasty. And he's longing to eat that. And then it says that he comes to his own senses or he comes to himself, which means he realizes, what am I doing? My father's servants at home had enough food for everyone in their household. What if I just went back home and I will tell my dad, I will say, I've sinned against you, I've sinned against the family, and I don't want to be connected back to faith. I just can I just be your servant? Because if I'm just your servant, then I I know that I'll have food. So he makes the decision. I'm going back home. And it says as he starts on his journey back home, before he's there, it says off in the distance, he's a little ways off in the distance, and his dad looks up, and when his dad looks up, he sees his son, and it says that his dad left what he was doing, and he runs up to his son, and he grabs his son, and he gives his son a huge hug and a giant kiss, and he, and, and he, said, he said, you are back, you are alive, you are home. And the son just looks, dad and says, Dad, Father, I've sinned against you and, I, and, I, and I've sinned against the family. He goes, I just want to be your servant. And he's like, huh, bull, no. Kill the fatted calf. Bring me the ring. Bring me a robe. Give me sandals. You are part of the family. Come on, let's celebrate for my son who was dead is now alive and we are going to celebrate this. Yeah? This is exciting, right? This is it, right? And, he, and he's bringing him in. Now, if you guys don't know, the ring, the robe, and the sandals, I mean, I give you a little insight to this, but back in the day, if you brought a ring and a robe um, and these sandals, the ring is the representation of usually a family. There's usually a crest on it. And so basically what he's saying is he's reinstating him back into the family, saying, you might have been gone, but you are part of this family. He brings in the robe uh, to know that he will always be clothed. He will always have a shelter. And then the sandals were basically for comfort. It's this idea that there will be peace. And you guys have probably read lots of Bible verses and stuff that talk about the, 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 the feet of peace. And then, anyways. Um, and so he does all this stuff and brings him in. And man, if this was an allegory, you all rejoice and we're all excited. Why? Because I'm the prodigal son, daughter, whatever, right? Like, that's me. I was lost, but now I'm found. And Jesus grabbed me, put a ring and a robe and sandals, and it's awesome. But remember, this isn't an allegory. God's trying to make a point to the Pharisees. Because, see, we were just talking about the younger brother. Remember, there's an older brother? See, the older brother's out in the field, and he's working. And he's working hard. And it's a hot day. And he sees a commotion going on at the house. So he calls one of the servants over and he says, what's going on? What's happening? He said, your father has ordered us to kill the fatted calf for your brother has returned. And this older brother goes, oh no, I ain't having this. And he storms to the house. And when he gets to the house, he looks at his father and he says, what are you doing? His father is shocked and he goes, what do you mean? Your brother has returned. And he goes, I have worked day and night. I have toiled so hard for you. And yet you've never even given me a goat so I, me and my friends could party. But yet, this son of yours, I love how he's not even part of the family still, did you notice? This son of yours goes out and squanders everything 
squanders all that you had. And yet he returns and you kill the fatted calf for him? And the father looks at him and he says, don't you get it? Your brother was dead, but now he's alive. And we need to celebrate that. And then the parable ends. And Jesus, sitting at lunch, looks over at the Pharisees to see if they recognize what the, po the point that he's trying to make. See, the point that he's trying to make is this. Pharisees, you may know God. You may follow all the rules and the regulations to a T. You may practice all of the, the sacrifices and all of the, the blessings. You may do everything good. You may know me. But at the end of the day, when somebody that doesn't know me starts to know me, you turn your nose up at them, saying that they're not good enough. They're not like you. So instead of rejoicing like you should be rejoicing, you sit there and judge. And then I stopped and I was like, oh, snap. Church, what's the one thing that people say they don't want to come to church for is because they'll get judged. Have we become the Pharisees? Have we forgot to rejoice for our brothers and sisters that were dead and now are alive? Have we forgot that our job is not to sit in a holy huddle, but our job is to go be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. Our job is to go to the slums. Our job is to go to the bars if we have to and talk to people about Jesus. This is our job. At what point did we transition to become the holy huddle? So anyways, then it started to make sense why Jesus was talking to me. God was telling me, Luke chapter 15, we got a building. Yeah! It means nothing if there is nobody that comes here, that, 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 if, if somebody doesn't come here and get saved. Does that make sense? This cannot be a holy huddle at all. We have to get into the mindset of this. Now that we have a place, oh good, we can put our feet up, relax. Uh, no, our job is just starting, right? There is a lot that still needs to be done. We just now have a location where people can show up now, any day of the week. That's all it is, and I pray that's what it is. I pray we have things here on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, and I pray that there are people that are lost, that are becoming found every single day in this place, and if we're not using it for that, then what are we doing, church? It is a waste of time and money and energy. I don't want to be known as judgmental. I want to be known there's a place where I can get loved. There's a place that I know, and I don't know what it is about them, but every time I'm with that church or with those people, I feel different. And I pray one day they will recognize why, what that difference is. I pray they would see the Jesus in you. I pray that the Holy Spirit would just move through you. And that, my friends, that is the part for me where I get excited about a building. Yeah. Not that we get to hand out flyers and say, come. But our job is to go. Yeah. That's it. And so here's the thing. If you thought, yeah, sorry, my bad. I, if you thought now that we have a building now, it's like, oh, good, I can have a place to invite them. No, no, no. It's still on you. Yeah. You still got to go make this happen. You still got to go live like Jesus. <laughs> I'm, I'll be real. We would not have this building today if it wasn't for somebody showing Jesus. What do you mean, Craig? There was a group, there was, well, A, my dad was being, you know, friendly like he always is. But the couple that he was being friendly with, the only reason he went up and talked with them is because they were praying in a restaurant out loud. My dad saw Jesus in them and he sparked a conversation. And that conversation led to us 
to this moment right now. So what happens if you start to live Jesus out? What happens when you start to go be the hands and the feet? Praying out loud. Not being like, I'll pray for you. Later. Quietly. In my room. With nobody else. Does that make sense? But what if you looked at somebody and say, oh man, I want to pray for you. And they're like, okay, thank you. And they go turn to walk away. And you're like, no, no, no right now. Right now. And it doesn't have to be a long prayer. It could be a short prayer. But all of a sudden, you know what that does is somebody else looks over and they say, oh my gosh, I saw those people praying. That was interesting. And then what did they do? And how did, I don't know where it goes. Like I said, I can't t tell the future. But here's the thing. I know when you start to show Jesus, things start to happen. Things start to move. So church, please don't leave it up to me. <laughs> don't give somebody a flyer and be like, let my pastor tell you about Jesus. <laughs> Do it yourself. Look at somebody and just be like, look, I go to church and, and, and I want to tell you about the relationship I have with Jesus. And then have that conversation. And then be like, if you want to, if you want to know more, there's a bunch of people we hang out with on a Sunday. It's kind of a party, just a little bit. And I'd like you to come hang out and see if they would join there. But please, don't make this a holy huddle. This is not what this is ever intended to be. So let's go be the hands and the feet of Jesus. See, if you didn't know, if we're going to make an allegory of these parables, you're the shepherd. You're the woman. You're the father. What? You got to go find the sheep. You got to clean and tear the house apart to find the silver coin. And you're the one that has to welcome home the sinner when he looks at you and says, I have screwed up royally and I need somebody that won't judge me but will look at me and give me compassion. That's you. That's who you are called to be. The point to these parables was looking at the Pharisees and saying, who are you? Who are you? Will you rejoice or will you judge? And so today, that's it. That's all I wanted to share with you. I wanted to give us a challenge and I wanted us to move forward because I believe God has great things for this community. And my hope is that this place would be a, a refuge, a place, of, a place of salvation for people, a place of peace and a place of comfort. And so with that said, I thought the best way that we could just crest it, uh, like crest in the building, however you say that, um, Kristen, Kristen, hey, that, that, that word, I don't know, it's, it's been a long week, month. Um, I thought the best way you could do that is, is praising God with all that we are. Yes. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to invite the band to come on stage, and we're going we're gonna to praise Jesus. But here's what I want to let you know, because this is our, uh, this is our, uh, this is our first time in the building. I, I want to share something with you guys that we didn't get to have at other buildings or other places. So this spot right here, there's a gap between the stage and the first row around the whole place. This place is known as the altar. Now, an altar is kind of a scary thing because if you said altar back in the day, an altar is where you go and you sacrifice things on it, okay? So um, it, you never wanted to be on the altar because that would mean that you were being sacrificed. Everybody with me? You didn't want to be on the altar. So here's the thing though, the reason we call this, is this the altar, because the altar was also, the sacrifice was giving something to God. It was a, it was a place of, of giving, or a place of giving. And so, at our church, from here and evermore, while we're here, the altar will be open for anybody that wants to come and just give their hearts to God. Now, you could be a Christian and still come to the altar. Because maybe you're just dealing with some stuff and you just need to connect with God in a greater way. You can come to the altar. You can come to the altar, you can kneel, you can come to the altar, you can stand, it doesn't matter. 
like, but Craig, it's so embarrassing because people would be looking at me. Listen, if you're coming to the altar, it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing because it's not about being judged. It's about coming and just giving yourself to God. And so I want to let you know, during worship, the altar is open. If you need to put your heart on the altar this morning and reconnect with God, then do it. If you need to come to the altar this morning because you just want to show God how much you love him, then come to the altar. I just want to let you know that it's open. The second thing that you need to know about are these amazing people to my right and to my left. They're not just standing there awkwardly. Well, I'm sure they feel awkward. But they're there to pray for you. See, they took up the task and the mantle, if you will, of saying, I want to pray for God's people. And so if you need prayer this morning, you just walk up to them. If they're standing up here at any time, walk up to them. And you can say, look, could you pray for me? And they will be happy to pray for you. So we're just doing a little church etiquette right now, letting you know that when worship happens, whether it's at the beginning or the end of the service, that the altar will be open for all of you. And if you need to come to the altar, you can. And if there's a flood to the altar, let it happen and let God just move. If you need prayer at any time and these people are standing up here, please let them pray for you. Watch what God can do. So to wrap this all together, Luke chapter 15. Are you ready to rejoice at the people that God's going to bring through you? Are we going to sit in judgment? The decision is ultimately ours, technically yours. But today, I pray that our church makes a decision that this place, this house, this house will be a house of safety, of comfort, of love. It should be a house of family and a house of truth. Amen? The last thing you need to know. A lot of people are like, oh, we finally have a home. And we clap and it's all excited. We have a home. I even did it too. I put up a big thing on the wall that used to be right over here and it said, welcome home, church. And then God slapped me upside the head. And he said, you're not home yet. The day that you see me face to face, that's the day that you'll be home. This is just temporary. And then it got me thinking. Some of your friends, they might not ever get home if you don't say something. Some of your friends and your family members, they need to hear about Jesus. So one day, they can get home and be with their true father and be in a true place of peace and grace. Amen? So let's worship him. So Father, we come before you. God, I ask, Lord, once again, that your spirit would just dwell in this place in a mighty way. God, I pray for all of those, Father God, that don't know you right now. And I pray that you would start to share with us those people that we need to talk to. And I pray, Father God, that this house, this place, would be a place of safety, a place of family, a place of truth, a place where people can find you, Father. And so, Holy Spirit, as we begin to praise you right now, I would just ask, Lord, that you would fill the room and just do a mighty work in all of our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all that agreed said, Amen.
ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive Come on than this tiny second of your life. See, as long as you got breath, God is still moving. So if God is still moving, he's worthy of giving a hallelujah to, amen? Oh, come on, y'all act like that ain't true. If God is still moving, it's worthy of giving a hallelujah to, amen? Hey. So, sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. 
Craig said, because I too was like, we're going home. Walk in, it smells like a new house. I love it. <laughs> then he goes, this isn't home. Home is when we see God face to face. <laughs> that rightful, that rightful moment. <clears throat> so there's a challenge now, because in scripture it says, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. So if you're in here and you know him, guess what? That's a challenge. That's a challenge. We can't stay in these walls. God is far bigger than that. He tore a curtain from top to bottom just to prove it was him. To make sure that we knew, I'm free, let's go. So, I don't want this moment to stop here, okay? The bridge goes, strongholds start to break at the sound of our voices, at the sound of our praise. Mountains get out of our way. Can't you see us dancing? There's no room for you to stay. No room. So God just challenged me with this right now. He goes, there is room if you let it. So I challenge you today as we get into this and we have a moment with God and we have a moment with, with, with just what he's trying to do and our brothers and sisters, I challenge you, get the mountains out of the way. Get the mountains out of the way. If you're in front leading somebody or trying to get somebody somewhere and you don't look confident or you don't look like you are excited about what's happening, 
Why would they come? That makes no sense at all. I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go. So move the mountains out of the way so that way as you move forward, they go, oh, okay, we can move forward too, amen? Okay, buckle up. We're gonna have some fun. All right. This may be a song that the captives can't yet sing, but if we sing long enough, they might join in with us. And this may be a dance that's too heavy for those chains, but if we dance long enough, well, the prisons will open up. Yeah, yeah. Shout long enough, well the walls might finally fall yeah. And they may need some help to lift their hands up in the air But we know that freedom's coming, so we'll sing it all the more We're singing, oh, oh, oh. we redeem now have a song We'll sing it all day long, till the rest come running home Till you make it here, we sing it. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, this may be to daring of a prayer to pray out loud, but would you send those orphans home? We've been waiting all day long. More ring and roll, we're ready. We can see them coming now. Just like the prodigal, we're gonna meet them in the row. We're singing, oh, we now have a song. We'll sing it all day long till the rest come running home. Oh, the broken can't hear me. We'll shout it out forever. Can't wait till you make it here. We're singing. of our voices at the sound of our praise. Mountains get out of our way. Can you see us dancing? There's no room for you to stay. Strongholds, come on. Strongholds start to break at the sound of our voices, at the sound of our praise. Mountains, yeah, yeah. Mountains get out of our way. Can you see us dancing? There's no room for you to stay. Strongholds, strongholds, come on. To break at the sound of our voices, at the sound of our prayer, yeah. Mountain, get out of our way. You see us dancing, no room for you to say. Last time, get them strongholds gone. Go, strongholds, start to break at the sound of our voices, at the sound of our praise. Mountains, get out of our way. You see us dancing, no room for you. Home, yeah. oh, 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 oh. Oh, the broken, can you hear me? We shout it out forever. Can't wait till you make it here. We sing it. isn't us who's welcoming people home alone. Jesus gets out in front of us and he stands in front of our issue, our problem, and he goes, hey, welcome home. Welcome home. And the more he says it, the more the saints surround him and we all start to say, welcome home. Welcome home. Whether you know you're welcomed yet, whether you believe you'll ever be welcomed, you're still welcome. Do you believe that? God, the God who knew you before he formed the earth is looking you in your life and saying, welcome home. All right. So can we join with the sound of heaven and welcome our family?
Father God, that's what we ask. God, we ask for our friends and our family members who may not know you yet. But God, I pray, God, one day they will be welcomed home. And so, God, we will do our part. We will fight for them. We'll pray for them. And God, we'll extend a hand towards them so that one day they'll be welcomed home. So, Father God, help us to be unashamed and unafraid to share your truth. Help us to have the opportunities to share your word, to share your truth, and to share your love. God, I want to just say thank you for this moment. And thank you, Father God, for the many moments that are going to happen in this place. Father, it truly is an honor to serve you. It truly is an honor to call you Lord, Savior, and Father. So God, thank you, thank you, thank you. And all that agreed said, amen. amen. Ladies and gentlemen, can you give a band a hand? Just thank you guys. Appreciate it, you guys. Thank you.